you got the essentials to get you from point A to point B, that was it. It's just designed for transportation. The car I used to hate. Well, I don't hate it anymore. It reminded me of when I was 19 years old and free as a bird. The car didn't overheat, but I think we did. Studebaker was always the independent. It was always the one that was different. It was always the one that dared to be different. And they were always the one that, uh, that really did. Uh, kept their pledge uh, and always gave more than they promised. And uh, I think that's why today there's uh, tens of thousands of people in this country who uh, still go agog over Studebakers. we're talking about was 1852 and the place was South Bend, Indiana. The event was uh, Henry and Clem Studebaker establishing a blacksmith shop. They had $68 between them and two sets of blacksmith tools. Uh, that first year they made two wagons. The company prospered. The Civil War helped quite a bit uh, making wagons for the military. At the turn of the century Studebaker had a decision to make. Do they play it safe and stick with the wagon? Do they uh, venture into the automotive business? Studebaker decided to do both. They started making electrics in 1902. By 1904, they had gotten into the manufacture of internal combustion gasoline-powered vehicles. The business turned out to be very successful, and by 1913, uh, Studebaker was one of the largest manufacturers of uh, gasoline-powered automobiles in the United States. Following World War I, Studebaker entered into an entirely new era. And a fellow by the name of Albert Russell Erskine from Alabama had taken over as president. This was a period of, of great expansion for Studebaker. They introduced the famous light six and big six models. Now, Albert Russell Erskine uh, wanted to make Studebaker the, the leading automobile manufacturer in the United States. And one of the ways he thought he could do that was to come out with a new high performance yet luxurious automobile. And in 1928, he and his team, led by Barney Roos, was able to do that. And we came up with the presidents, uh, which really took this country by storm. The car is a 1930 Studebaker seven-passenger sedan. The president was the, the top and most expensive model. I retired in 1989, and one of the first things in my objective was to get a car to take in the great race. And that's a the Great Race is really a timed tour from coast to coast in the United States. And since we were doing it on kind of a low budget, it was just Mary and I, we didn't have a chase car, any parts car, trailer or anything. So we took all of the interior out of the back and I put the tools and spare tires and tubes and the spare starter and generator and all kinds of stuff back there, not knowing what, what I was going to need. And on our whole trip, over 8,000 miles in about five weeks, uh, we had two flat tires and that was it. We had no problems at all. Our air conditioning was limited to opening the windshield, but on the Mojave Desert, Mary had some special air conditioning to make it a little more tolerable. A couple of ice bags. I had my feet on one bag and I had the other for uh, chilling towels that we kept on our necks because, and we drank a lot of water it was, um, it was an experience. The car didn't overheat, but I think we did going across the <laughs> desert. Doing the Great America Race was a test of a 60-year-old car and a 23-year-old marriage. And happily, they both returned intact. Right now it only has 48,000 miles on the odometer, and that's original. So it's had more miles going to and from the coast to coast here in the United States than it had in all of its years in, in Europe. The car was originally purchased by the president of Portugal, General Carmona. Uh, the general always wore a sword on his right side, and he sat in the right rear seat. And the finish on the uh, upholstery is all worn off in a spot there where his sword used to rub along the side. The, uh, the general, from what I understand, was a rather petite man. He wasn't a big, heavy man, but he must have liked a real firm seat because when I was cleaning out the car after I originally got it, I was noticing there's uh, some newspapers stuck in between the springs in the back seat. 
and I pulled a few of them out, and the, uh, the seat is stuffed with old Portuguese papers from the 1930s. So mo I left most of them in there. But <laughs> I don't read Portuguese very well. <laughs> Well, you will notice on the inside of the car, uh, on either side, are two glass flower vases. And I always put fresh flowers in them when we take the, the car, either to a car show or just for a ride. It just adds a nice little touch. Looking at the car evokes a feeling of royalty. Uh, certainly, I feel regal driving in it. And knowing that royalty did at one time sit in the back seat, that's pretty neat. That's a pretty neat feeling. But once you get driving, it really it drives relatively smooth. It steers easily because of the long wheelbase and the weight of the car. It's really reasonably comfortable riding, especially on, on the highways at speed. Parking in the city is a bit of a challenge because the, the steering is a little bit heavy. If you do the work yourself, it's a lot of work. And if you don't do the work yourself, it's an awful lot of expense. But I enjoy doing the, the work. I, I don't work very fast, but then I don't pay myself very much, so it's, uh, it's easy. I can spend a week going over a car, getting it ready for a tour or a show, and that's, that's relaxation for me. There were two very important events uh, for Studebaker that occurred in the late 20s. Uh, one of them was the successful introduction of the President 8. The other one was the failure to enter the low price field with the Erskine model. Uh, yes, Albert Russell Erskine brought out a low price car that he named after himself. Uh, as you could see, the man had a bit of an ego. Uh, the car, unfortunately, just did not sell well. By 1933, the company was in dire financial straits. Uh, they were forced to enter voluntary receivership. Uh, Albert Erskine, so despondent over what had happened, wound up taking his own life. You know, American legends are really hard to kill. They're tough, and so it was with Studebaker. Uh, there were two fellows, Paul Hoffman and uh, Harold Vance. And these guys turned out to be miracle workers. They came to a company that had no cash. They came to a company that, by all accounts, should have gone out of business. And within a matter of, of months, they had turned the company around, got production going again in South Bend, and then they did something else. They hired a young French-born designer by the name of Raymond Lowy. This was a man who understood streamlining. This was a man who understood where the world was going to. Raymond Loy was given the task of designing an all-new, low-price car. What he came up with was something rather remarkable. It was the champion. This vehicle is a 1939 Studebaker Champion. It was the lowest priced uh, car of the line. And it's a very basic model, a stripped-down economy car. It has only one uh, sun visor, it has one uh, windshield wiper, but it also only has one taillight. you got the essentials to get you from point A to point B, which is uh, uh, the standard uh, three-speed transmission. Uh, the only uh, additions or extras on the car were bumper guards and a heater, and uh, that was it. It's just, just designed for transportation. With the 1939 Champion, a new car for a new world, they ironically advertised what was basically a very mundane and ordinary car in a very lavish way, presenting ladies with large hats as if they were going to a cocktail party and people lounging by swimming pools for what was actually a very workaday car. When it appeared in the showrooms, people took notice. And the other thing that was going for Studebaker at that time was, I think even the name Champion itself was, was just the perfect name for this car. Uh, it was a totally new design, it uh, had no components from any other Studebaker, and it was uh, designed to, to compete with Ford, Chevrolet, and Plymouth with the same amount of interior room, but the weight was much less. In fact, the slogan in the Studebaker engineering department at the time was, weight is the enemy. My uncle, uh, Bill Kelly, who bought this car new in Colorado, was a cattle buyer and a very successful one, and he was also at the same time very frugal. 
So when he went into the dealership and bought this car, he got a very uh, economical vehicle, one that was no nonsense. It did what he wanted it to do, which was to take him from one ranch to another as he bought his cattle. And it got very good economy. And so to him, the fact that it had one windshield wiper and one sun visor and one taillight was, was of no consequence. It did what he wanted it to do, and it did it very well, and he took very good care of it. Driving this uh, 39 Champion is, is a true pleasure. Uh, as you start the vehicle up, you get a, a series of emotions and uh, the sound of the engine, it's smooth idle. Also, it's easy to handle because of the lightweight and the, and the precise steering and it, uh, it, it goes down the road very well. The Champion assured prosperity for the South Bend Auto Manufacturer, Studebaker. Uh, and brought the company in very good shape uh, when World War II broke out. Uh, during the war, like other auto manufacturers, Studebaker uh, produced military goods. In their case, it was uh, rugged military trucks. Uh, they produced aircraft engines for uh, bombers, and they produced the uh, all-terrain and amphibious vehicle known as the Weasel. Uh, when the war was beginning to come to a close, Studebaker was looking ahead to peacetime. In the United States, uh, there's a term, and I think we've all heard it, you ain't seen nothing yet, and that was certainly the case at Studebaker. The new 1950s Studebaker has revolutionized motor car styling and performance. Truly, it's the next look in cars. So far ahead of the field, it will stay new looking for years. So be sure to drop in at your Studebaker dealers and see the new 1950 Studebaker. See the 1950 Studebaker today. People were still intrigued with this idea of science fiction. In science fiction, I think everyone knows that a rocket ship is going to have a nose cone. And what more logical thing to appear on a, an automobile of, of its time than a nose cone? In reality, it became known more commonly as a bullet, but, uh, but, but I think that's really probably how it came to be. I graduated from high school in the 50s. And so it, it was a fun time. It was when uh, so-called rock and roll was uh, coming into its own. There was always the correlation between the local um, drive-in theater, where, where of course all, all of the cars of that time would go, uh, and the, the local drive-in restaurants. And the more distinctive car you could have, the more you fit in there. It was the Saturday Night Cruise. Studebaker in their 1950 advertising were the first to take up the rocket sci-fi element which was to become so popular later on with other manufacturers. And in the brochure we see a car taking off, leaving behind the glittering lights of the city with a suburban couple smiling as they enjoy their trip to the Milky Way and the firmament. Of course, I suppose every schoolboy had his own choice. My choice at that time was Ford. I mean, you, you couldn't sell me on a Chevy or a, a Plymouth, and, uh, and I would have been absolutely embarrassed if my father had bought a Studebaker, but fortunately he didn't. Fortunately for me at that time, in retrospect, it would have been the greatest thing he could have done. <laughs> but I thought, the, I thought the Studebaker was something of a, of a homely car. It was uh, just a few years ago that I, I was looking casually for an older model car to just play with. So I saw this 1950 Studebaker advertised in the local newspaper. Said, well, that certainly sounds interesting. A 50 Studebaker, the car I used to hate. Well, I don't hate it anymore. I'd like to go see that. <laughs> um, I bought it, had it painted, and there it is. And the first Muppet movie Kermit and Fozzie Bear are traversing the country and they're trying to escape some, uh, some people who didn't particularly appreciate their, uh, their brand of entertainment. 
So they go running out and they jump in this car and Fozzie Bear is driving the car and Kermit jumps in along with him and he looks around and he says, hmm, Studebaker, where'd you get it? And he said, Fozzie says, my uncle left it to me. He says, oh, did he die? Fozzie says, no, he's hibernating. <laughs> when you get in the Studebaker, you have to reorient all of your thinking because it's, uh, it's a different uh, thing altogether. Um, first of all, it's the so-called three on the tree. It's uh, a three speed on the steering column. And of course, it's also not power steering. Um, so for this reason, um, in, in order to uh, take as much advantage as you can of the law of, laws of physics, you have to have a steering wheel that's about this big. Once I've parallel parked, I usually have to sit there about five minutes just to recover and gain my, my breath and my composure. <laughs> But uh, for the most part on the road, it's, uh, it, it's fun to drive. In 1952, Studebaker celebrated its centennial, and a full 40 years before the next oldest automobile company would celebrate its centennial. And in 1953, Raymond Loy's team, led by Bob Burke, came out with another very exciting automobile, uh, the famed uh, hardtops and coupes, also known as the C&K bodies. Unfortunately, Studebaker had production problems and quality control problems in introducing these new cars. And it wasn't long before the company was in dire financial straits again. Studebaker decided to seek salvation uh, through a union, and they chose the Packard Motor Car Company uh, uh, to join with. Some observers have sort of likened it to, to two drunks trying to help each other across the road. Uh, both companies were really in a very weak financial position and, quite frankly, did not have very good management teams at that era. Uh, ultimately, the Packard mark uh, failed and uh, was completely gone by 1958. Studebaker uh, struggled on, and they had one other little trick up their sleeve, and that came in 1956 when they decided to come out with what they called America's first family sports car, and that was the Hawk Line. And the leader of that entire line was a rather fabulous car for its era, the Golden Hawk. I was driving a 1950 Chevrolet at the time. That was really bad news. I spent more time working on it than I did driving it. And on one night, I stopped in at a Studebaker dealer in Saginaw, and I asked him if he had a Hawk. And before I left that night, he had taken my credit application. I was in debt up to here, and I had a Hawk. I picked it up in the morning, and the Chevrolet I was used to driving had a speedometer that went to 100 miles an hour in increments of 10, 10, 20, 30. The Studebaker speedometer went to 160 in increments of 20. And before I went 20 miles, I wasn't paying attention, and I thought I was doing 35. Well, I was doing 65, and I had my first ticket before I had 10 miles on the car. <laughs> I had worked for a fella that uh, had two teenage boys and they always wanted to go double date and go out because they didn't have a car and they didn't have a driver's license. And they were always bugging me to go out. They were, I was, they were a lot younger than I was. And I said, well, I got the car, you get the girl. And they said, we don't know anybody that old. And I said, well, that's your problem. And finally they come up to me and said, well, we found a gal that's a lot of fun and she'll go. And you tell them what you told them. I said, well, I really didn't want to go out with anybody that old. And they said, well, he's got a nice car. I said, oh, okay, I can be bought. <laughs> well, we drove one all the time. I mean, all the time we were going together, and, yeah. it, was a, and it was a ton of fun. We uh, had a lot of good times. She yeah. told me that she, when she was, well, she, we just started going together. She told me she never drove a car that would go 100 miles an hour. And uh, on a Sunday afternoon on our way to Saginaw, we did 100 miles an hour, except that we went through a speed trap. <laughs> and before, With me driving. <laughs> and before it was over, uh, the state police officer was not a happy camper. <laughs> he socked her $125. <laughs> Which that was, was 1025 in today. <laughs> in today's money. That was a lot of money back in 1956. I, I collected enough tickets to probably paper my bedroom before I was over. <laughs> We 
we traded that Studebaker in and it had 120,000 miles on when I traded it in. And it had, the only thing I did to it was put brakes on it and tires. It never, never went back to the dealer for service. It was a wonderful car. And we bought a 1959 Chevrolet. We went about 10 blocks and I looked at her and I said, we traded a better car than we bought. And if I ever get the kids educated and all the bills paid, I'm gonna have another one. Eventually, we got all the children raised. We had enough money to go out and look for another Studebaker. So we bought one sight unseen and it was delivered to the end of our long driveway and I had to get in and drive up to the house and I got in and the dashboard, the steering wheel, everything was the same and I started to cry. <laughs> yeah, a lot of memories. It reminded me of when I was 19 years old and free as a bird and didn't know a thing about life. And the image as far as the car itself was concerned was very fast. Uh, and if, if the people that wanted to drag race you or race you knew it, they wouldn't. They knew better. Uh, it could beat anything that uh, GM put out. And so consequently, it, it really was a, was a kind of a muscle car image for its time before muscle cars really were developed. This is a GM town, uh, the home of Chevrolet and Buick. And everybody that works any place usually works with something for GM or connected with GM. And they really didn't like the idea of you driving anything but a GM product. And they would make very derogatory remarks you know, about where did you get that uh, toy, uh, where's the key that you wind it up with, and uh, all sorts of funny things, which really didn't bother me because they couldn't beat me. Unfortunately, the sales of other Studebaker vehicles were not going well at the time, neither cars nor trucks. Uh, Studebaker looked like they were finished, uh, looked like the handwriting was on the wall. But, like I say, American legends are tough to kill and they had one more trick up their corporate sleeve. Talk cars and you gotta talk to women. Listen to these three. My husband loves the hot ones, but I wanted something elegant. Phil and I spend most of our weekends hunting and fishing. Obviously, we needed a family car. What did they get? Studebaker. Because they're different by design. Different by design. 1963, Raymond Lowy's magic was back again and they introduced the Avante a car that uh, was very sleek, very advanced, fiberglass body, incredibly fast, setting dozens and dozens of speed records uh, all across this country. Unfortunately, Studebakers weren't selling, and every year's sales were going down. Finally, on St. Patrick's Day in 1966, the last car rolled out of the Hamilton, Ontario plant, and 114 years of automotive history came to an end. The Studebaker emblem, you'll notice, it has an S. And you might, I just thought of this now, that might mean special, because I think Studebakers are special. They're not run-of-the-mill, and uh, the people who appreciate them and, and drive them and collect them are also special people. And uh, so I guess that would sum it up. It's a, it's a special car. 